Welcome to We Are Everyone, a video and podcast series powered by Pivotal Moments, and we focus on the intersection of mental wellness in the workforce. We bring together young professionals and mindful executive mentors to bridge the generational gap and bring to the surface conversations about the importance of mental wellness and how to overcome career tradition challenges. Mental wellness is paramount. Join us. Welcome to We Are Everyone. I'm your host, Jen Sherman, and we have a very, well, two very special guests today, as always, and even extra special since they're Penn State alumni, and we know we love Penn State over here at Pivotal Moments. But I would love to introduce um, Dr. James Delatre. Uh, he is the Associate Vice President for Research, Director, Office, Entrepreneurship, and Communi- Communicate Commercialization at Penn State. That was a that was definitely a, um, a mouthful, <laughs> but welcome, James. Welcome, Dr. James. And we also have Danny Dickstein. Uh, he is the brand partnerships manager at TikTok. And formerly, he also worked at Snapchat. So he has all the social media tools going on. Welcome to you both. Jen. Great, great to be here, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So we always like to start off the interview with a quote around mental wellness. Um, It is uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, May. uh, Just to kind of let you know some context, we started We Are Everyone last year during the pandemic, during Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we've really been observing the statistics around mental health and mental wellness within the past year as the um, pandemic has hit. So Starting off with a quote from CNN, uh, within two months of lockdown in 2020, a Kaiser Family Foundation poll found worry or stress had led 56% of U.S. adults to experience at least one negative effect on their mental health and well-being, such as problems with sleeping or eating, increased alcohol use, or worsening chronic conditions. So I wanted to jump in and kind of think and really pose the question is, you know, while mental wellness should always be a concern, um, it's always been, in, it's obviously been increasingly important throughout the past year. You know, how do you see that growing demand um, sparking innovation around mental wellness? I'm happy to go go first here. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think a, a question a lot of people are, are, are asking right now. Um, I think one of the um, real challenges of the pandemic was that at the same time that all these external stressors were coming in, um, concern about um, the health of our loved ones and stability of our jobs, um, many of the outlets that we use to manage our stress, the, the gym, patronizing, the, you know, going to the art museums or socializing with friends, travel, all of that was curtailed for public health reasons. So it turned into a real pressure cooker, um, you know, for, for a lot of folks. Um, for me, which, you know, what kind of signaled that innovation was going to accelerate was when um, Lululemon bought Mir uh, for, I think, a half a billion dollars. And, you know, that was a kind of a surprise move. But what it showed was that some of the established re- um, retailers they wanted to make sure that they could reach people in their homes and their healthy habits remained. And they wanted to, to create new channels through this disruption. So to me, that was kind of a signal that, that um, things were accelerating from a, an innovation standpoint, given this, this pandemic context. So um, yeah, definitely interesting times. There've been many uh, additional examples since then of kind of accelerated innovation in, in our, our current context. They were ahead of it. And, and Peloton, you know, they were just so yeah. ahead of the game there. So how about you, Absolutely. Danny? What do you, uh, what do you think there? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing that I noticed and, and I can only speak to my uh, experience uh, and I know we'll talk more about this later, but the biggest thing I noticed, I think was sort of like the emergence of, of different companies that, that all had sort of different angles and, um, you know, different value adds for, for people in, in different types of situations. And something I've thought about is maybe that those companies ha- have been around longer than we thought, but it was an opportunity for them to, you know, get discovered. Um, I, I think it's sort of, you know, um, a flywheel where, you know, we are, you know, possibly using social media and using the internet in more in different ways. Um, and so it's, it sort of presents an opportunity for us to like, you know, find these different companies. Like I said, I can only speak to my own experience, but there are so many like different, 
you know, companies and speakers and ideas and exercises um, that I've learned about, you know, just from from being home and, and discovering. So I think like that's something that's that's here to stay. Yeah. And speaking about, you know, I well, I'm a half glass full type of gal. Um, I think that looking at the this past year of all of you know people have been trying to survive but then at the same time kind of looking at these things you know i always like to say and i probably say this in every single interview is that we really pulled back the curtain of our whole world and like what we've needed i mean there's been you know mental health uh we had on um uh a fellow who used to work at uh open table and you know talking about the hospitality industry i mean there's always been a mental health crisis throughout the hospitality industry but now it's finally being recognized so i think thinking more ahead of how can we be you know putting together this mental wellness programs and being having these open conversation and then and that's where really entrepreneurship and innovations and social media come into play to help kind of bring all this together one more thing is like I think that you know there's a lot of people who have recognized um, you know what mental wellness and what their mental health like means at, at different more you know surprising times you know it's something that you don't you know often expect so I think uh, it's it's great like that um, and you mentioned companies are, are talking about it more like I think we're entering a phase where it's um, you know it, it's more uh, appropriate and, and more accepted to share your experiences. Definitely. And, you know, quick side sidebar to James, you know, from working at the university this past year, and I know, um, you know, one of our, our colleagues, Ben, he was graduating from Penn State uh, last May, and it was just kind of this huge transformation of going from college to then entering the workforce. So I was kind of curious what that temperature was, uh, pun intended, uh, at Penn State in regards to uh, you know, outgoing students and also, you know, graduate students and all of that? Yeah, great question. Um, I think, you know, we collectively felt really badly for um, so many of our students because there's an expectation of, of kind of what the college experience is like. And there are these milestone moments. And um, so many of those just didn't occur for the classes that have just um, gone through. But there's some great examples of how, um, because we've got fantastic alumni that are willing to kind of engage, um, we were able to take students that had jobs and pivot to, to different situations where maybe they didn't get exactly the job they wanted, but now all of a sudden they're in a remote work dynamic that they didn't even think was a possibility and might work really well for their lifestyle. So, um, I think that there was a little bit of a silver lining in, in some situations, but largely, I mean, I think we just felt really bad that some of those traditions and things that are anticipated just, just weren't realized fully for, for that class. But I'll tell you, I think they're going, to, I think this, I think the individuals that were in college kind of having that experience through this, I think that, that um, those that have learned how to to take advantage of the of the coping skills that have learned how to value their mental health through this, I think they're going to be set up for success. I think that they're going to be able to to navigate all types of challenging situations in the future because they had to, in many ways, grow up earlier than they thought that they 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 would have to. So, um, I'm, I I think there could be um, you know a silver lining in this for for this class, but. But unfortunately, you know, they, they didn't get to do everything that, that you'd hope. I would agree with that, James. And I think, uh, you know, as the millennials where we're, you know, Danny and I are the same age. And I think having that kind of five years under our belt, if you will, of like the career experience was able, I'm not going to say it was easier than like people who were graduating, but at least we kind of had our feet on the ground. But at the same time, being sensitive to the fact that we are, you know, still kind of trying to figure out what we want to do with the rest of our lives, too. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, having that 
kind of resilience built in because you have to, I mean, we are resilient as humans, um, is really, I think, going to empower the the, the Gen Zers. And we had John Simpkins, Simpkins on, um, who's head of the music school at Penn State back in the summer. And, you know, he was just talking about these opportunities for students as well and kind of, you know, where did theater go, right? You know, how can you supposed to, it was, it was a really difficult time, but I think it's that resiliency factor, which is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd love to move into, you know, I guess the themes and innovation is kind of a heavy hitter here as a keyword for the interview, but I think it's important to really talk about as we kind of have this breath of fresh air finally coming, um, coming out of the pandemic. So, you know, what have you seen? And I know we kind of alluded to this, uh, briefly, but what are some of the most, what are some of the innovations that you have found most inter interesting that have come out of 2020? Um, did you want to start Danny? Yeah. Um, I really think that, you know, from a fitness perspective and, and James, you touched on this a little bit, like working out at home was the only only option. And if you didn't work out, you know, maybe it was a new option. So kind of going back to like what I was, you know, my my first, you know, first uh, answer there was like uh, there are so many companies that you're getting that are being discovered from a fitness perspective um, and a wellness perspective, you know, mirror comes out uh, some of these like home, uh, like contraption things, you know, like there are these boxes that you can like do all different exercises, the squats, the bench press, um, you know, even companies like, uh, you know, fitness classes like Rumble and, uh, and Peloton for one. I know Jen, you mentioned that like a lot of them had to rethink like what their uh, like their virtual at home classes look like what that offering looks like. And in some cases, like, like redefining like what their business looks like. So I tend to like, honestly agree with what James said, like, I feel like that there really is a silver lining uh, in the same way that the students who, you know, had to, uh, you know, figure out how to, you know, be academic and, and have their, their lives at home. Um, you know, if they've made it out there, you know, there's a silver lining for them moving ahead. There's a lot of, this is a defining moment for a lot of companies and for me specifically, I'm, you know, interested in looking at the, the fitness and, and, uh, the fitness space as, you know, falls under the wellness umbrella. Cool. Yeah. How about you, just, James? just, yeah, building on that, um, you know, so, so the, the kind of mental health focused self-help apps, the growth there has been phenomenal. So. Calm and Headspace are, are kind of the market leaders, but um, I was reading not long ago that there are now over 10,000 different apps that are related to um, mental health. Um, and so that, you know, there are only a handful that are really dominating the market, but it just speaks to the fact that, you know, people are, both sides of the market are, are surging right now. You've got people that have something that they want to share, strategies, tactics, and they're they're working hard to, to reach that audience and, and you know, through, through um, you know, mobile apps is a logical way to do it in so many cases. Um, but, you know, there's also just, you know, huge demand where people are, are at home and asking the questions. And it's really encouraging to see them seeking out strategies, adopting them, and, and, and it's actually sticking. So it's, you know, a lot of, lot of these, um, uh, you know, apps and, and strategies, you know, they're, they're, they're not dipping as the pandemic is dipping, but rather they're just now healthy habits that are, you know, part of their lifestyle. So I think that's, that's hugely popular. The other area I have to mention is telemedicine. And so I, you know, I've got two young kids and over the last year, my wife and I, our kids, my parents, they've all had telemedicine um, wellness visits of some sort. And that process in so many cases can can kind of take all the inconvenience and cost and friction out of visiting the doctor. Like I think that that has huge potential going forward because if you can take cost out, you can take the inconvenience out, you're going to find many people are are proactively going to the doctor and, and doing preventative medicine rather than waiting until they've got a health crisis to go see the doctor. So I think that that should I hope that that transforms a huge aspect of, of uh, medicine because all of the reasons that people said it wasn't a good idea were largely proven just not to, not to be true. So like, as you were saying, uh, Jen, pulling back the curtain, I think that's an example where it totally got pulled back. 
Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And also to the point of the telemedicine is like, I think it's also how can we provide more access to more people for these things? I mean, think about innovations and digital transformation around education this year. Um, and also with the telemedicine is that, well, if those, if the costs are going down less, then we can give more access to people in our country. And then at the end of the day, you know, not to get all, this is not a political statement. This is just an economical statement of less, you know, it will cost less to, for healthcare and for education with the digital transformation. So I think I'm really excited to see where that goes. Um, I think another thing that I would like to bring up before we um, kind of hop into the next topic is, so people have been saying that we're, you know, in a place for the roaring 20s. I mean, for example, we had, of course, like the age of the Steve Case and AOL and the Microsofts and Facebook, like they got kind of lucky, right? Because it's kind of like they got ahead of the game of big tech. But now it's like you said, James, so many apps. I mean, TikTok being one of them, Snapchat being one of them. I, I I'm curious to see where all these people have all these great ideas right now of how to fix the world, which I'm here for it. But now, like, how do then we how do we kind of navigate through all of this? Because people, everyone wants to fix something, I feel like right now. So I'm cr- kind of curious, even Danny, of what you're seeing on the social media side and media side of how you're kind of picking and choosing or seeing, you know, what's in the marketplace um, as well. And, you know, James, after feel free to chime in like it's such an interesting interesting topic and it feels like all this is like even more accelerated in the past year um you know, and for me it's something like i think about all the time like being being in social media but but also you know like being a person who I, i'm somebody who like I, I try to really like you know explicitly set away time so like not look at my phone or, or to read or like to go outside uh, and just like, you know, the last year has made me like really more diligent about that. It's not always easy, but, you know, it's something I do. But, uh, you know, you think about like, I, I think each of these different apps sees themselves as providing something different. A lot of times we like to talk about, you know, like we group in like Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat, like and Facebook, like, you know, they're all the same. It's all social media. Well, um, you know, and TikTok too. Well, you know, they all are providing something different, you know, whether it's, you know, Snapchat is, is really for communication. Um, you know, Twitter is for news. Um, you know, being at TikTok, you know, we, we talk about it really is an, an entertainment platform. We don't really think of ourselves as a social spot. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, how these are going to, uh, I really think that there's a lot of people who are trying to move away. Uh, you know, it's funny, all of these social media apps and social apps are almost creating this world where it's like, okay, if we're going to be using these, these apps, um, then let's introduce mental wellness. It's something like to help like combat that. Uh, and then on top of that, um, you know, in my own, my own life and, and, you know, friends and colleagues I have, a lot of people are starting to move towards, well, I need to, you know, as I mentioned, explicitly set away times for more experiential vacations. It's almost like this overcorrecting type of, of feel uh, in some ways. And I think we're like just at the beginning of it. Um, so all that ramble is to say there is like a really interesting interconnection. I agree with that. And I understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> How about you, James? Yeah, the um, when you cross over to an area like you know mental health, um, I, I do believe that there needs to be some thought given to um, quality control or kind of um, you know giving some edge to evidence based treatments. I mean, if there are twenty thousand mental health apps, you know, clearly they're not all from, you know, an MD uh, that that has kind of done uh, clinical trials and all these key kind of gates that you'd want to go through before you deploy a treatment, right? So so I think that we will see a narrowing as some of these, um, you know, prove to have enduring value and others that just don't get traction because, you know, that there isn't uh, really a there there. It's just you know, someone kind of um, putting their idea out there. But you know, I don't think it should entirely be the the market that that decides some of these. I think there there you really do need some professionals in the middle as well. 
And so I don't know what the solution to that is, but, um, you know, I think as we see this convergence of, of kind of, you know, self-help and, and areas where, you know, getting mental health right is, is really important. I think that there, there do need to be some, there needs to be some guidance or some evidence-based kind of um, uh, validation that gets inserted at some point. But the mechanics of that are, are, are beyond what, what I would be able to comment on. Yeah, just quick, quickly there, you know, it's interesting because, so I like to disclaimer, you know, I'm facilitating conversations. I'm not a mental wellness expert. I just know it works for me. As you can see, like my Peloton bike in the shadow, like that's something I do every day. <laughs> but uh, that is a disclaimer because to your point, James, really very, very important because you have a bunch of people now and even kind of prior to this is like these um, nutrition coaches or like health coaches in some regards of, you know, where is your health degree exactly? Like, do you have a mm -hmm. degree? And even on Clubhouse, which is another social media platform or, you know, whatever they want to call it, um, community platform is they'll have these mental health or mental wellness, like clubs or, you know, clubs. I'm like, I'm looking at the profiles. I'm like, none of you guys are like, <laughs> They don't have credentials. So again, I'm here for, I'm here for having a conversation about it. It's just, I was talking to my friend, um, Joe, who I'm going to have on the podcast, who's actual, like about to be a licensed professional. I was like, I don't feel comfortable going on this podcast until I'm actually licensed because it's this whole, there's a whole thing around that too. So I think, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, thinking about all the big tech and all this technology, it's going to be really important to kind of cut through some of that noise when it comes to the quality of these mental wellness um, applications or resources. Maybe I'll have to wait for the podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was, I was I think, say, uh, I think we're on a delay, James. I'm going to take it. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, I think I'll have to wait for the podcast for this one, but how does, how does Joe feel about like what you just mentioned with the, you know, there's a crowded space with people who are, you know, not licensed and he's, you know, he is putting in the work to get to that level. That's where I think this whole aspect of, um, survival of the fittest, if you will, of like the actual credentials, cause they'll have everyone kind of talking around, but then we're going to have this influx of this whole group where like, in order to kind of, it's kind of like that validation factor, like the check mark on Twitter, of, you know, are you a check mark licensed professional? You know, it can be like, it could be a conversation, but I think if you're actually providing advice, that's like, if someone's sitting here and they were having, um, you know, if there was a clinical, something that had to be addressed, like, I'm not going to sit here and give that person advice. Like, that's just something that, you know, is interesting. But another point to make is that I will say that in March of last year, I was like, let's just start with a new therapist. Why not? Let's try a new one. I, I quit because I was like, she is, mental health professionals are, we're going through the exact same thing of timeline as we were. You know? <laughs> so she was talking about, she was like, I just got my groceries delivered. I was like, is this what I'm paying? Like, is this what I'm paying an hour, like for an hour rate, right? like to talk about our delivered groceries? So I was like, I think we need, we need to allow like also healthcare a little bit to catch up. So, you know, it's like cyber, like lawyer, cyber, uh, you, it's really hard to go to college, so, not college, uh, law school for cyber law because it's being created constantly. So it's just something, you know, as we go back to the word innovation, uh, I think that's just something interesting to note there too, as it comes to mental wellness. Yeah, I, I think that there are two, there are kind of two stages in kind of the, the overall kind of journey. The first is build awareness, have people even, you know, start talking about, you know, their, their, their mental state, you know, checking in and, and just, you know, getting them through that gate where it's even something that they're acknowledging. Right. And, that, and that's critical. And I don't think you can overdo that. Right. Just getting more people um, cognizant of, of this aspect of their overall well-being. And then the next question is, given your particular circumstances, what's, what's the, the best approach for you, right? And, and I think that's where you need to start to, to find those professionals. Um, but I think that there's, there are a lot of kind of common sense in between things like fitness, that you don't need a health professional to say, hey, you probably need to get some exercise in your routine if you're spending you know, 11 hours a day on Zoom, right? 
So, so I think that, that there, there's quite a lot to be done before, you know, the, the gate ends up being the volume of high quality uh, professionals out there. So, so I think this podcast, this conversation, hopefully that the kind of first stage um, and, and awareness building is, is, you know, one of the things that, that comes out of this broadly, right? For people that wouldn't be part of the conversation, become part of the conversation. I agree. And James, real, you know, just a quick question too, just piling onto that, you know, what has been, um, what has kind of been your greatest challenge within this past year? I mean, I did see, you know, I spoke to the president of the small business entrepreneurship council and, you know, we've just, there's been between all the small business loans, PVP loans that have gone out, these ideas, you know, what, what challenges have you mm -hmm. kind of seen within the department? Um, and how have you kind of tried to continue to combat those? Yeah, um, you know, there there was, um, you know, a huge surge in requests for business services nationally, as, as you would expect. Um, so I oversee um, Penn State's Small Business Development Center. It's part of our office. Um, and uh, they work with regional businesses um, to support, um, you know, the small businesses that are hitting all those roadblocks. So the, the volume of kind of one-on-one -on -one consulting and advice that that team had to provide to businesses that were struggling, trying to figure out how to apply for PPP loans. Um, it was pretty staggering, but they stepped up. Um, and at the same time, they're trying to do one-on-one -on -one consulting, you know, largely they're at home, they have families and dogs in the background. Um, so kind of, the same way you were talking, you know, I, I was actually thinking about um, my team, as you mentioned, you know, your, your um, uh, mental health professional that, that was kind of downloading on, you know, the challenges of everyday life in this kind of new world. Um, I really admire the folks on our team that managed, you know, having, you know, the family at home, the, you know, the pets, and also having to give some really detailed advice to business owners that, you know, had their homes mortgaged, right? I mean, these are, this is, these are, 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 are dire situations. And they managed it. I, 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 they, they, they beat every expectation I had in terms of professionalism. So I, I came away from the whole thing, very inspired by what people can do whenever they know that, that, um, you know, livelihoods are on the line. Um, it made, it made me very proud of Penn State in, in many regards. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, Danny can speak to you. I just think the power of community when it comes down to, you know, I got more involved with um, the as alumni of Bullis, which Danny and I both attended for high school and even, you know, trying to give back to to Maryland of, you know, how can we just kind of come come together with our minds and like come up with solutions because everything is happening in real time. Right. And we just all are trying to I think 2020 was the year of surviving. And, you know, even the companies that were, quote unquote, thriving more than others, it was because they were helping all of us survive. So I think, you know, thinking about that mindset of, you know, while you have the screaming kids, you know, maybe not screaming, but might be screaming in the background or, you know, a package getting delivered, the phone going off the hooks. I mean, it's like, it, I think there was this like power of authentic, uh, authenticity that really came into play and empathy as well. So that's where I think it's going to be interesting to see how we, you know, go forward. And Danny, before we hopped on to the other topic, I wanted to give you a chance to reply back if you had any comments. I, I echo uh, echo all that, and um, I also I think the companies, just to your to your point, and James, you mentioned it kind of too, is the, the companies who are evolving, who are recognizing that like it's a different world than it was in in twenty twenty or in, like, before twenty twenty. Um, you know, like there are companies who are just, they're taking on the challenge and saying, hey, like this is different. We need to be thinking about our employees. And, and even, you know, James in your position, professors and, um, you know, uh, teachers of all levels are, you know, looking at this. They, I think the ones that are gonna see the most success and most growth and the healthiest growth are the ones who are like understanding that it's, you know, everybody is facing new challenges. Um, so um, it, I, I think, I think there's silver linings in this, as we've talked about at the top of the show. Yep. And, you know, half glass full or, you know, making lemons, making 
lemonade out of lemons, all those, uh, all those analogies. Well, I'm going to hop into my favorite topic of the show. Not saying that those were not, but this is just something that I have, um, a huge passion around even before starting We Are Everyone and before the pandemic hit was like the future of work, right? I mean, hello, like we're all sitting, like, I don't know if you're at home, James, but I'm at home, Danny's at home. And first off, like we're all in different states, which is really cool. But thinking about the future of work and the four generations in the workforce, um, and, you know, as you alluded to the Gen Zers coming into the workforce with this, you know, uh, huge belt of resiliency, given their uh, experience of their last year in college, and understanding that all of us communicate very differently. And when we talk about, you know, the aspects of something like, oh, no, anxiety or something of, you know, being um, even if it's just having being not being angry that day because something might have happened at home or at work. It's, you know, I think now with these four different generations in the workforce, you know, how can we you know, what have you seen um, and in the past year and beforehand about how different generations can communicate around the topic of mental wellness and just to better learn to un understand each other, uh, particularly as like also, no, it's a long winded question, but also looking at it's not just about how older generations can teach the younger, but how the younger can also teach the older. So with that, um, I'll leave it to either James or Danny to start. I I'm happy to start here. So I, um, this is something that um, so I was actually part of a workshop on intergenerational learning um, that uh, was was uh, done by a, a faculty member in the Collar College of, of uh, Agriculture. And one of the things that was loud and clear, we had we had folks from from you know, four different uh, the, the four different generations kind of uh, as part of this workshop and panel. Um, the the Gen Z folks that are entering the workforce that are digital native and um, I think just are more empathetic given, um, you know, how, how they've uh, grown up, the, the, um, the way that they've sourced information, the way that they've networked, the, the values that they have. It's put them in a unique situation where they're the educators in, in many situations, which is very upside down, you know, from the traditional, you know, apprentice model where, you know, you, you, um, you know, learn under the guidance of the elder. Um, but I think that the combination of technology and the value that empathy brings uh, to society have kind of flipped that upside down. Um, and just one of the, the, I had this kind of nagging question coming into this, this um, podcast. I was like, What's the economic weight that poor mental health has on the global economy? And it took no time to find the stat, which was $5 trillion. And so you know, we can talk about the younger generation just kind of being empathetic um, from a you know, bleeding heart standpoint, but it actually just makes good sense to have you know, people happier, healthier, they're more productive in their lives, the collateral damage in society is lower. And so I, I think that there's a really unique time period that's emerging here where younger people are going to lead the conversation um, in many regards. And, and, um, and I actually think that the older generations realize that it has to be that way because they, they, they're not native in, in some of these uh, conversations. They have increasingly been learning from the younger generations and, and kind of technology has taught that, right? Where you know, the, the older generation can't, you know, get their computer set up or all those kind of things that they, they've learned that they do have to, to kind of listen. And so I, I think there's a real opportunity to um, have some of these concepts uh, grow, but not in the traditional way. Yeah, $5 trillion. Wow, we better get on this. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, that is, yeah. Well, Danny, did you want to um, go to your comments there as well? Try to keep it brief, just because one, I agree with with all of that. I, it's I think this like I have so much to say on this topic. Like it's so it's so interesting. I think like the first thing that comes to mind, um, can't remember which one of you said it, but like I think millennials are a very interesting uh, part of 
the life cycle of social media um, because we actually grew up without social media and then adopted it, you know, in give or take, you know, early high school uh, or, you know, uh, early college, depending on where you fall. So we sort of have this hybrid understanding of life before and life without. And then, of course, you have a, an older generation, maybe um, uh, a boomer generation or whatever is between the boomers and Gen the millennials. But Gen thank X. you, Gen X. Yeah, that was a layup. Um, <laughs> you know, they they have uh, a whole lifetime, you know, several lifetimes before the introduction of, of social media. And then you have the Gen Z, as you said, James, like they don't know life without it. So um, I think it's just so fascinating to think about, you know, um, you know, where <laughs> I think about like my first job in New York City, like as um, uh, at an ad agency and like understanding like the, the tools of communication um, between, you know, me and leadership uh, and other people on my team, how that's evolved. And then more importantly, like uh, how, like what was it, what is uh, and what traditionally has been expected of employees going to traditional offices like we could talk like for an entire show about this. Um, but I think like, and I said, I was going to try to keep it brief. So I'll just close it by saying like, James, I think you hit it. Like the, the like there is like this real empathy that bleeds from the Gen Zers because like th they almost see like a lot of things in today's society that are like, well, wait, hold on. We've been doing this a certain way for so long. Like this doesn't really make, make sense. And you see it in so many different ways in so many, different, like we could talk for so long about this, but I think that the companies sort of what I was saying before, the companies were uh, going to adopt like this hybrid model of understanding uh, where Gen Z's are coming from. Um, and really like where most people are coming from. We've got a taste of working from home now. Um, and so, mental wellness uh, can only lead to better produ productivity, um, you know, happier uh, people and output and, and all that stuff. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's just so fascinating because I think we've just really hit this inflection point. Yeah, it, I think it's true. And, you know, we had on um, uh, my dad who wrote a book on the crisis disengagement and how, you know, we are there. That was well, that was before, you know, he wrote that well before the pandemic hit, but this has been an issue. And this was, and this was when we were talking more about the millennials, uh, Gen X and baby boomers. And now with the Gen Zers who are going to come in and kind of be like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, which we kind of, I mean, each generation's doing that. Like I love, I was, I think the future generations or older generations for setting us up for success. It's just now, you know, given this digital transformation that we're in, like, we all like it's the thing is of the crisis of disengagement is like it's more of the survival of the fittest because like you can't really coast anymore because we're all just trying to like keep our businesses alive so the coasting like i'm hoping that this is to you know i think james and danny both hit it is going to accelerate you know engagement rates because you can't I mean, I'm in it every day, like learning new skills, even though I own a business, because like, I don't want to, you know, look back in 10 years and be like, I have no idea what what's here, you know, so I think like, that's something that and I've seen because if something else, you know, it just, it's important, it's important to kind of embrace that. And um, I like, I, we could have a whole other podcast on the topics, I think that we could, there's a lot of unpacking to do there. But, you know, to your point, um, I think, if anything, they're resisting social media a little bit more because of they grew up with it. So like they're more and I think, Danny, you said something where they're moving. I think we're moving a little bit more towards uh, that, you know, the snapshots of the world is the why the Gen Zers love it so much is because it's private conversations. WhatsApp, you know, we are seeing the we're seeing Signal, Telegram, all these other like kind of more intimate conversations. You can have groups with them pop up without being on a Facebook group where you get piled on with like, who knows, you know? So I think we're going to see more of that shift happen um, from a social media perspective because Gen Zers are like, this is too much. Like their accounts, a lot of them are private on Instagram and they have thousands of followers. I don't know how, but it's just, it's interesting to see that shift happen. Trading like every, I should make a list. Uh as these as i start to think of them and they come up but it like it's infiltrating in all aspects of life um that whole concept of wait 
you guys were doing it. And like you said, Jen, like, you know, we have been, you know, we're grateful um, that, you know, traditions and, and uh, institutions have been set up to get us to this point, obviously. But, um, you know, there's a really interesting concept of like, this is this has been done for so long. And I think it's just like industry or concept, uh, business idea by idea, just a domino effect. Um, and maybe maybe we do have to do a round two. Yeah. James, did you have anything else to chime in there as well? Yeah, I just wanted to, to make the connection between um, empathy and, and the digital native um, and having been someone who, you know, is, is that uh, Gen X just to date myself. I didn't uh, get my first email account until Penn State issued me one uh, as a junior. So just give you an idea like I, <laughs> of kind of, you know, where, where I am in that technology curve. Um, so um, the, the thing that I think has radically changed was, you know, when I was growing up and, and in college, the, there were very few ways to actually um, learn about a cause or an injustice or a way to volunteer. Um, and, and so the, the, that ability to sift through many different types of information and find something that really resonated with you and then to actually engage in that and somehow, like that was a, you know, a paper, someone standing on a street corner with a pamphlet kind of engagement um, when, when, I, when I was a freshman in college, right? So um, just the chance of you kind of finding that cause that you're passionate about and, and being able to um, get involved either in a, in a direct or indirect way, um, just, you know, it, it was an analog process. And so I think, you know, in the current climate, People can, you know, learn about many more things, find the thing that's really resonant with them and then get involved um, at a distance, which was just not even, you know, possible in, in you know, a generation ago. So, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why and I think that's really powerful and needs to be protected um, because, you know, that's a, you know, a, a, a better contributor to society is someone who's informed and has avenues to engage to, to you know advance a cause whatever that may be whatever they're passionate about um, and I think it's great for, for an individual's mental health and we, we know that people that volunteer have, have better profiles in that regard so so I think uh, there will be this kind of pendulum that swings in terms of you know, too much um, you know too deeply uh, you know engaged and losing sense of the world around them and then swinging back and saying okay I need to to pull back and, and do something more experiential. I think that that that's pendulum is going to swing back and forth for a long time. But I think the, the ways to connect in a positive um, context need to need to be protected because I think that's something really wonderful about the Gen Z folks that, that I'm meeting on a regular basis. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that, James. And to your point where it's like I've always said that embracing the older traditions and matching them with the newer traditions, because we can't lose the older. We can't we can't lose, you know, the to do list on computer paper. I've been doing this since I started you know, my career like years ago. I, I have to write things down. So that should never learning how to do cursive shouldn't go anywhere, you know, like calligraphy, like just <laughs> making sure you know how to write in cursive, like that should always be really important. So you know, always just continuing to learn from each other and having these open conversations. I mean, part of the reason why we started the show was to, you know, sorry, I feel like we were a little millennial heavy on this one, James. So that was, we were getting a little sidetracked and excited <laughs> here, but typically it's, it's nice to have on someone from having two people from different generations. So we can have these open conversations around these topics to, you know, come together and, you know, create the best solutions we can for society. Um, well, I know we're taking some time here as we can probably go on for that topic for a while. Should have started that one earlier, but we always like to ask our, uh, our guests, um, in wrapping up here, what does mental fitness mean to you? That one, um, let me, miss. I mean, I, I think that to not, I think. Mental fitness to me is really a, it, it's a constant 
um, you know, part of, you know, what, what otherwise I would categorize as like, you know, my personal hygiene. Um, like it is a daily, um, constant thing that, um, I think for me is something like I'm, I'm really, really dedicated to almost perf perfecting it to, to have tools at my disposal, um, to, to help when, whenever I, you know, something is off or when something is, is good. Um, I think the last year for me, it was almost like I final, finally settled down from, you know, like not even a nine to five, it's, you know, you're nine to six, seven, and you're coming home and maybe you're doing work. Um, and then on the weekends you're doing stuff and, um, you know, maybe you're exercising, maybe you play sports, pick up sport or something. Um, and when I finally just like stopped, um, you know, having that lifestyle, I think it all started to really catch up to me. Um, and it's something, I think I said this at the top of the show was like mental wellness, mental fitness for, for everybody, um, comes at certain times and, you know, maybe some people aren't there yet. For me, I kind of realized, wow, this is something I really need to be attuned to. It's something I really need to focus on and learn and get better at and like accept it. Um, uh, as soon as I did that, like, it's just something I, I'm really, really like, um, I love trying to, I hate to use the word perfect, but I love trying to tackle it, I guess you could say. Um, whether that's, you know, fitness, uh, think about sleep, getting into good habits. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, and it's a, it's a work in progress always, but for me, I'll just bring it back. Like it's just part of my personal, like daily, you know, hygiene. Yep. I love the word hygiene. That's a good one. I like to call, we have digital hygiene, which is to make sure that we don't get our, uh, personal data stolen and then we have personal hygiene so that's that's a good one how about you james and especially you know with also managing a family too i'm sure it's uh a lot to yeah. just kind of have that reset every day with the mental fitness oh i don't think you could characterize uh, me managing the family i'm pretty sure that, that uh, they're managing me most of the time but um but yeah i mean you did um you you you've nailed it jen um kind of at that stage, so I've got an 11 year old and a nine year old. And, and so kind of at that stage in, in um, my life and, and uh, my wife's life where so much of kind of where we are mentally is, is related to kind of how, how our, where our kids are and, and, and where our parents are as well. They're, they're, they're all, you know, approaching 80. So, um, you know, they've got issues as well. So our, our mental health is very much kind of, um, connected and dependent upon how everyone else is doing. Um, uh, there, there's an old saying that um, you're only as happy as your least happy child uh, when you're a parent. And so, um, you know, making sure that the, the kids are navigating a you know, very unusual, you know, situation with school has been really important to us. It's great. It's been great to live um, in, in Happy Valley here in State College. Um, because, you know, many concerned, educated people. And in fact, we have two world-class virologists that are our next door neighbors that helped us kind of create like a, a protocol around having a pod for our kids to play with their kids and, and a group task, ta a group text where we kind of flag if someone's been outside of the pod and quarantine procedures. So maybe we went overboard a little bit, but at the end of the day, you know, we were all, uh, very safe and, we're able to create some normalcy, uh, you know, for the family through all this. And in fact, had more together time, you know, uh, just weren't nearly as programmed as, and, and that's a, that's an issue with families in general, right? They over program and, and just kind of run around from, uh, you know, sport to sport and event to event and, and lose track of kind of together time. And, and so, um, you know, circling back to the comment of there being some, uh, silver linings throughout this. That certainly was one for our family. And, and um, you know, I, I think um, as, as we come through this, I think mentally we're all we're all in a pretty good spot. And that's more than I could have ever hoped for when, um, you know, th things were on the horizon uh, a little over a year ago. So, yeah, you're, you're very perceptive that that uh, the family is the driver there. I love that. I think, too, to your point, James, I mean, me, being able to being overly programmed is something that. I can attune to of like, you always have to be somewhere and all the time where it's like, just, I think, you know, I locked down with my family. I haven't been with them 
for probably 10 years and, and added my sister-in-law and a dog. So that was, <laughs> I, I mean, I silver lining, that was like the best time ever because, you know, I, you know, I, we have, um, I'll be an aunt. So they have a kid on the way. So it's like, it was one of the pandemic, uh, pandemic pregnancies. But so I just think that looking at these moments of, you know, being able to all be together is kind of the silver lining and, and, uh, really just being appreciative of, you know, what you have around you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, also one last question before we wrap up is how do you flex your mental fitness muscle? So sometimes, you know, I would say some people, even people have, of course you have breath work or working out and we both know, you know, that we've talked about fitness, but is there something else, whether it's like listening to music or like sh singing in the shower, painting your walls that, you know, helps you release endorphins and kind of get you back in a good mode? It's, it's, uh, it's podcasts. Um, I think that's something maybe we, we could have talked about earlier. Like, um, like how, how popular have podcasts become? like they're almost like this safe haven and and i try like if i'm uh, if i'm feeling like lazy or tired or you know blah whatever uh i try to get outside go for a walk and throw in a podcast whether it's something serious um you know you know news a daily thing or something like i subscribe to maybe something less serious um that's just a sort of a safe haven for me i love that how about you james yeah yes yeah, so um you know, as part of my job, I get to work with um, just incredible entrepreneurs uh, every day. And it's exhausting just trying to keep up if you're plugged into Zoom six to 10 hours a day with people that are super smart, passionate, you know, have deep technologies. So, um, you know, to counter counterbalance that and, and uh, you know, I, I can say that, you know, I don't read technology books in the evening anymore uh, because uh, I'm overwhelmed with it. So uh, my COVID project was um, I ripped three decks off the uh, off of our house. We have different our, our house on the side of a hill with random decks that are staged at different levels and rebuilt it starting. I guess I started last May and finished it in November. Um, and so just put in a, an insane number of hours, um, you know, go out there at six o'clock and work until, you know, eight 30 and, and then every weekend. And, um, I, I think the neighbors thought that I was building an arc given just the, the volume of cutting and, and work that happened over the, the course of, you know, that six months. Um, but it was awesome to have a physical task to focus on and to kind of take all this chaos and build something that was productive and valued by the family. And now we're, we're hanging out and, and having barbecues on it this year. So that was a, a really a great escape for me. Yeah. I, I would say that anything outside, I don't, I can't even watch shows at night anymore. So I, I hear you James. And luckily that's why podcasts have been on the rise because you just have to listen to them um, rather than having to, watch anything. I'm hoping that my eyesight's not going to be shattered in like 30 years because of this <laughs> pandemic, but we'll see, uh, t to be continued on that one. But I just wanted to, you know, thank you both for, you know, coming on here today. You know, really felt that momentum and kind of, a, like I said, we could probably have expanded on some other topics. Uh, I, I, I sense a round table in our future. We can throw in some other, uh, maybe people from another big 10 school for some rivalry. But um, I just wanted to thank you both. I wanted to give you just the opportunity if there's anything that you wanted to leave with the audience before wrapping up. Yeah, uh, for having us, it's awesome. It's so nice to meet you, James, and talk about this stuff. Cause it's, I think it's fun to talk about this stuff um, and it's important to talk about it. And, um, you know, it, I think we all have to start like getting comfortable, you know, talking about it mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's really central to our our happiness, and um, yeah, the, the sooner we can get comfortable doing that, I think the better off we'll all be. Great. Yeah, th thank you for shining a light on on this topic. I think it's um, you know important from in our interpersonal relationships through the economic health of the of the country and the world, um, and and so I, I don't think it can be over. I don't think the importance can be overstated. And so thank you for creating this, this forum to, to have people tell their stories and to draw more individuals into the conversation. That's, that's the path to success. 
Love it. Well, I just want to thank you both. We have Danny Dickstein. He's uh, he works at TikTok, brand partnership manager, and we have Dr. James Delatre. Uh, he is the associate vice president for research director, office of entrepreneurship and commercialization at Penn State. I think I got that better the second time. Uh, well, thank you to the both to you both. I'm your host Jen Sherman. Uh, you can subscribe to. We are everyone on uh, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. I'll also be in the outro, so I don't know why I'm repeating this right now. But uh, we will catch you next time. And thank you so much, you two. Thank you for tuning into another episode of We Are Everyone. You can subscribe to We Are Everyone on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and also be sure to visit www.pivotalmoments.org to learn more about the organization. And we also want to hear what mental wellness means to you. So you can follow us on social media, submit your video, and uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you so much.